All right, good morning, everyone. As the Executive Director of the Burnbound Women's Leadership Network, I'm thrilled to welcome you to our second annual symposium. Today, we commemorate the centennial of the 19th Amendment, a hard-won effort by relentless lobbying by suffragists, including NYU Law alumni Eleanor Burns, class of 1907, Jesse Ashley, class of 1902, Inez Milholland, class of 1912, and Crystal Eastman, also class of 1907, who after ratification went on to draft the Equal Rights Amendment. These trailblazing women and their fellow NYU Law alumni recognized that the vote was only part of a larger social justice framework. They advocated for access to birth control and workers' rights, and Kate Hogan, class of 1893, coined the slogan, Equal Pay for Equal Work. <laughs> Milholland believed that when women finally won the vote, it would bring a revolution of a new and bewildering kind, touching on and changing life at every point. She was right. As we'll hear on our first panel today, the 19th Amendment's ratification was a watershed moment. We've made incredible social justice gains over the past century in society as well as right here at the law school. For instance, when the 19th Amendment was ratified, NYU Law had just admitted its first women of color students, one of whom, Anna Jones Robinson, class of 1922, would go on to become the first woman of color admitted to the New York Bar. Today's 1L class, which is 50% women and 37% students of color, would be absolutely unrecognizable to those pioneering alumni from a century ago. As we celebrate these gains, we also know how far we have yet to go. Moving into the next century, we hope to translate 50% women at the law school to 50% women at the top of their legal field, following the examples of Sheila Birnbaum, class of 65, and Sarah Moss, class of 74, who launched the BWLN to support NYU's women's students and advocate for women across the legal profession. Outside the law school, our alums continue to advocate for vital battles for, such as women's rights, voting rights, reproductive rights, and racial justice. Our second panel and our keynote conversation today will address those battles for 2020 and beyond. The 19th Amendment has indeed touched and changed life at every point over the past 100 years. Just looking around this room and this country, women have gained an incredible amount of political power over the past century. How will we keep that momentum and what will we do with it next? Thank you all for being here. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Deborah Malamud, who will moderate our first panel. Professor Malamud is the Anne Bryce Professor of Law at NYU and a leader among legal academics who study issues of class and public policy, as well as an expert on labor and employment law. Prior to joining NYU and serving as the faculty director of the Anne Bryce Scholarship Program here from 2004 to 2011, she was on the faculty of the University of Michigan Law School and clerked for Judge Lewis Pollock of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania and Justice Harry Blackman of the United States Supreme Court. She is a graduate of Wesleyan University and the University of Chicago Law School. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Malamud for our first panel, Historical Perspectives on Citizenship and the 19th Amendment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network and my colleague Melissa Murray for having put together this fabulous symposium uh, this year. And I really look forward to sharing with you the experience of learning from these fabulous panelists, uh, which has been a real joy for me. Um, let me get, you have longer introductions of each of them in your program and, and suggest you look at them, but these are just some highlights. Um, Rabia Belt is Associate Professor of Law and a Professor of History by courtesy at Stanford University. She's a legal historian whose scholarship focuses on disability and citizenship. Martha Jones uh, is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History at the Johns Hopkins University. She is the author of the award-winning Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America, and of All Bound Up Together, The Woman Question in African American Public Culture, 1830 to 1900. Forthcoming in September 2020 is Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Fought for Rights for All. 
Adrienne LaFrance is the executive editor of The Atlantic. She was previously a senior editor and staff writer at The Atlantic and the editor of TheAtlantic.com. And finally, Elaine Weiss is the author of The Woman's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Vote, which has been hailed as a, quote, riveting, nail-biting political thriller with powerful parallels to today's political environment. Among other awards, The Woman's Hour received the American Bar Association's highest honor, the 2019 Silver Gavel Award, recognizing outstanding work that fosters the American public's understanding of law and the legal system. Uh, Martha and Elaine's books are available here for sale, I am told, which is lovely, and they will be signing <laughs> copies after the panel concludes. Um, so we've decided to use a roundtable format rather than a sort of stand up and present format. So we will be in roundtable conversation around the historical issues for about an hour, and then we'll open the discussion up to your questions for about 20 minutes, so, so be thinking ahead. So I want to start with what you might think of as the conventional story of the 19th Amendment. So historian Liette Gidlow has written that for a long time, there was a single dominant narrative that, and here I'm quoting her, treated the suffrage struggle as a self-contained American story that began in 1848 in Seneca Falls, and after many trials and tribulations, was brought to a triumphant conclusion in 1920 by heroic middle class and elite white women with ratification of the 19th Amendment. That's the conventional story. But that dominant narrative uh, is breaking down in the work of contemporary historians who are introducing a number of perspectives that complicate that story. So Martha, you've written that a discussion too narrowly framed by the 19th Amendment relegates many American women to the margins of the story. So I want to open by asking the panel, what happens to the narrative when we include the perspectives of women of color, women with disabilities, and other women for whom the 19th, for whom the 19th Amendment's suffrage did not in fact amount to a right to vote that they were free to exercise? So let me start there. So I guess I'm guilty, and so I <laughs> should get it, get it started. Um, but before I do, I, I want to thank um, Deborah very much for um, leading us uh, in this conversation. Um, we appreciate everything you've done to you. convene us. Um, and thank you, of course, to the, everybody at the Birnbaum Center. Um, so I do want to start off by um, introducing um, African-American women into this discussion from the start. And indeed, when we do, um, the conventional narrative um, gets strained, um, becomes forced, um, returns again and again to a small handful of African-American women who um, were indeed part of um, the suffrage movement that we associate with ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, but I do want to suggest and lead us off today by asking what happens when we widen out the frame. One way we might do that is by mm, gently setting aside the term suffrage and set this conversation in a framework of voting rights. Then what happens to our story? And who comes into the story when we reframe it by those terms? Um, what happens when we recognize that American women, including African American women, well before the convention at Seneca Falls um, and at later that year in Rochester, before those conventions, um, American women are in anti-slavery societies, in their churches, in, in my case, the colored convention movement, already making strong and in some instances successful claims for what we might term voting rights, um, who elects a bishop, um, who sits on an executive board in an anti-slavery society. These are questions that all precede 1848. Um, and then of course, um, I don't have to tell this audience that in 1920, too many American women remain disenfranchised. Um, Jim Crow um, makes black women equal to black men in 1920, if only because now men and women are equally kept from the polls. 
And so we might look out to 1965 and the Voting Rights Act um, as another touchstone in this broader story of voting rights. And so the historians are indeed here um, to trouble um, the conventional frame, um, but I think more importantly to contextualize the 19th Amendment as an important milestone um, for all American women, um, but certainly not um, a triumphal endpoint in that story. I guess um, I'll just add to that and add my thanks to the organizers. There are very few people that could persuade me to fly during a global pandemic. <laughs> but <laughs> Melissa Murray is one of them, so <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, also, uh, Claire Whitman and the other organizers for their fabul fabulous logistical work, Deborah Malamud for um, assembling us and leading us during our, um, I guess, straight table <laughs> conversation. Um, so, I think along with um, the lovely remarks that Martha gave, um, disability also complicates the uh, story that we have uh, about the conventional wisdom of suffrage. Um, so one thing I think that, ha that we've been reminded of this week is that even though we have the 19th Amendment and the US Constitution, voting is intensely local. And what happens in state and localities matters a lot. And if we look at the states, we see not just the fact that many women were voting before the 19th Amendment based on state laws, but also um, many folks were banned from voting based on state constitutions. And one of the groups that was uh, restricted from the vote were people based on their mental status. At that time, people deemed as lunatics and idiots. Um, there was part of a broader um, banning of people whose um, perceived mental competence was not seen as up to snuff. And it was not just people that were seen as having the, the label of lunacy and idiocy. It was also African Americans and women writ large were seen as people um, who did not have the mental competency to vote. So one of the things that I look at is how some suffrage activists leveraged or thought about or challenged this idea of mental competency in order to gain the franchise, but one of the costs of this strategy was really reinforcing um, the disenfranchisement of other people based on mental status. So I have some visual aids for this. Um, so one of them is this painting, which was commissioned for the World's Fair. So the woman in the middle is a prominent suffragist and temperance activist. Um, Frances Willard, and then she's surrounded by her political peers, um, someone who is an Indian, someone who is a convict, but then also um, a lunatic and an idiot. So with images such as these, it was not to say that all of these people should be enfranchised, it was just the person who was in the middle, sort of the respectable this elite white woman as opposed to sort of the peers that were disreputable, that really deserved to not be uh, voting. There are also political cartoons such as this where there's a woman who is literally chained to an imbecile and a criminal. Um, these are all people who were unfit for self-government. The same sort of idea in terms of the center person is the one who should be fit for self-government, as opposed to the, um, the men next to her. This was a women's suffrage poster. Um, it says, votes for women, convicts, lunatics, and women all have no votes. It was distributed. Um, this was a campaign kit that suffrage activists used that, that they distributed across the country. Um, since they alone they can't vote, imbeciles, children, women, criminals, these are the disenfranchised. And then 
I have uh, a song, which is a parody. I'm not going to sing it for Aww. you. Um, sorry. But just note the last lines. Class me as well befits with males who've lost their wits. Felons and idiots class me with them. Sort of the sarcas sarcasm. And this, which was um, sort of part of what was going on where um, some white women were calling on white men to um, sort of pull them out of this disreputable group of people who were disenfranchised, um, sort of using chivalry as a way to gain political power. Um, and it also, I think, indicates the power of the vote. So it wasn't just in terms of getting the political candidate of your choice into office. The vote was a meaning-making enterprise. It signaled uh, citizenship. It signaled um, aesthetic beauty. Um, it signaled that you are not disgusting, that you are not disreputable, and that you are competent. Um, and all of these things really sort of continue to be attached to people that didn't have the vote. And I will say right now that the majority of states still disenfranchise people based on mental status this, to this day. Um, and um, so there are sort of costs and benefits to um, this campaign. Yeah, hello. Um, hi. And I also want to give my thanks to the Birnbaum Institute for convening us and also to NYU Law because, as you heard, um, it was the law school for the suffragists in many ways, in New York and, and even nationally. And it trained, legally trained, a lot of women who used that training uh, in the movement because it was a very much a legal strategy and, uh, and then went on to be leaders in both um, civil rights and, and, and women's rights. Uh, and also <coughs> the, the Brennan Center which uh, for uh, justice, which uh, is under the auspices, I understand, of NYU. And I use their material all the time as I go around the country and bring this story into the present, uh, talking about voting rights and restriction of voting rights. So I use the, the, the uh, information uh, on the, the wonderful Brennan Center website about what the states are doing to restrict voting now. Uh, so I was looking at it just yesterday. Uh, so I want to thank you for that. Um, what I um, think is important, going back to the original question of how do we disrupt and widen this, na this standard narrative, uh, which I would venture that most Americans view the women's suffrage movement, whatever uh, time frame we want to give it, uh, it doesn't matter because it was Elizabeth, Katie Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony, and it was just them. And they lived to see the whole thing. They started it, they ended it in 1920, they're long, long dead, doesn't matter. Um, and so just widening it is you know, to, to understand that there are leaders, not only in, in the larger national movements, but in all the state movements, in all the city movements, in you know, Lily Devereaux in New York. You, there were many, many, many important um, women who are leaders, are political leaders, and think in political ways. But I think one of the exciting things for me, um, as we mark this, 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, is that it's, it's given uh, rise to new research, disruptive research, um, uh, widening research, but what's so exciting is it's being done on the local level too. So that there is uh, a new effort to dive into those records that Martha talks about um, in the churches, in the black churches, in the black women's clubs, in um, Hispanic communities, and to see what were these women doing, because it's not in the history of women's suffrage. Um, it's not in the standard resources. You've got to dig deeper. And it's more difficult, and there are big chunks missing. But that, I think, is the most exciting part of commemorating uh, the centennial of the 19th Amendment. It's given rise to this whole uh, new effort of broadening and deepening uh, and bringing in voices that we never 
heard before and complicating the story. Uh, one example I'll give is uh, an organization in Tennessee. Uh, my book takes place in Tennessee, so I, I do spend a lot of time there. And there's a wonderful organization called Chick History. And what this does is they have, they go out into the communities. I mean, uh, local historical societies, um, also into the cities. And they say, it's sort of like antique roadshow for, um, for suffrage history. And they say, go into your closets, go into the attics, go into your family Bibles. See if you see anything, especially in the African American community, that signals that maybe grandma or great grandma was involved in a voting rights issue or a suffrage issue. And they're getting amazing things. Now, it's hard, um, and some of it doesn't pan out, but that's the kind of research, not top down, not, not the most distinguished historians, but really at the grassroots. That's, that's, I find, really, really exciting. So I think that's one way to, to broaden and, and disrupt the, the traditional narrative. I, I wonder if I might ask a, a, a couple of follow-up questions, see if you want to bite. Um, um, you know, the 19th Amendment um, is written to parallel exactly the language of the 15th. Um, uh, um, it doesn't affirmatively grant a right to vote to anyone. It says that the right to vote shall not be denied on the basis of a particular right. And, you know, we all know how that went, uh, on, went in, in terms of the 15th Amendment. And they, it's not just that we knew how that went. They could see, those who were framing uh, the text of the 19th Amendment, could see how that was going in terms of race. And I wonder if any of you were interested in reflecting on why that lesson wasn't learned, um, why the 19th Amendment takes the form that it does take. It would be um, remiss of me not to um, remind us that we sit here this week yes. marking uh, 150 years since ratification of the 15th Amendment. Um, and I think it's a point of reflection for us um, to ask why we will convene, many of us, again and again this year um, around the anniversary of the 19th Amendment and um, the 15th Amendment will re receive um, far less attention. Um, but to your question, Deborah, I think that when we dig into the debates, um, and here I'm thinking of congressional debates that uh, precede ratification, um, precede the issuing out of this amendment to the states, um, we understand that um, in those debates, the 19th Amendment and the 15th Amendment are um, very much um, linked, locked together in those debates. What do I mean? Um, in those debates, among um, the proposals that make it to the floor of the US Senate are ones that would trade the 15th Amendment for the 19th Amendment. Right? Um, Southern lawmakers who um, are in no way um, nascent feminists, <laughs> suffragists, um, are prepared right, to um, barter women's suffrage, white women's suffrage, in exchange for repeal of the 15th Amendment. Um, so this is all to say that, um, yes, um, lawmakers are cognizant of the, the language and the, the vagaries um, that are possible by way of this language and are prepared to exploit that, um, to um, anticipate taking advantage of that um, by whatever terms the 19th Amendment um, ultimately comes to be ratified on um, because the lessons of the 15th Amendment is that you can, um, at the state level, um, you can eviscerate um, you can undermine, um, you can undercut the force of these constitutional amendments as, as they're framed. Yeah, I just wanted to, to add that, that the wording uh, based upon the 15th is, is uh, for all those political reasons, but historical reasons also, um, it was written, um, it was drafted to be an answer to the 15th, which, which did not include women. And in great anger and, and distress, uh, it was to be the answer to that. You left out women uh, in, the, 
in the 15th Amendment, w women need to be in there, and so they frame it in the same way. What happens, it's interesting, during the ratification battle, too, uh, in Congress, of course, where there are all these uh, amendments proposed, even in the last day of, of debate in, in the Senate, there are um, uh, amendments only white women can vote. They try to get that into the, um, to amend the, amend the uh, 19th. Um, but when it goes into the southern states for ratification, one of the prime uh, arguments used by the anti-ratificationists is basically, remember the 15th Amendment. Mm. Remember the 14th and 15th Amendment, which we were forced, forced, in their words, to adopt to be able to re-enter the Union. And remember how that destroyed, quote unquote, Southern civilization. And so this is used, and it's not subtle, I mean, this is in their broadsides, uh, the 14th and 15th, and this is going to open up a whole can of worms. Uh, if we ratify the 19th and give, supposedly, um, the federal government the power to tell us who can go into our voting booths, because it is state, um, state law, voting rights is, is uh, ascribed to, to state law in the Constitution, um, well then, you know, people might notice that we are not enforcing the 15th Amendment, or the 14th Amendment for that matter. So um, it's used as the 19th Amendment, because it is phrased that way, is a danger to southern states because it will also uh, bring up the whole fact that we have undermined and are not enforcing the 15th Amendment. So there are lots of ties to it um, that, that sometimes are you know, not obvious. So, Sorry. did Robbie, did you want yeah. in? Okay. It, it is striking in terms of um, sort of American memory, or at least the way that we think of law, that if you survey people about what they think the most important right is that they have, often people will say the right to vote. Um, sometimes it's um, some idea of sort of the First Amendment, sort of uh, freedom of speech, which people don't understand either, but um, that, that we don't have sort of this federal sort of national mm -hmm. right to vote, that voting is a big donut with a gigantic hole in the center <laughs> um, seems to elude folks. So it's quite easy in the United States to still restrict the vote to people you want using procedural mechanisms. So that was one thing that was um, a legacy of the 15th Amendment, right? That people knew that you could still keep the vote away from the, the people that you consider to be undesirable if the 19th Amendment was framed in this negative way in which the parameters of the vote or the procedures were still left to state as localities to fill in. Well, I don't think there's any choice about that. I mean, the federalist system, it, uh, the states are in charge of election law. Is there any, uh, well, could I mean, they we, have, we, we could have, we could could have, have changed it? that. Right? We, <laughs> in, in the whole constitution. Yeah. Yeah, right. well, constitu it, it's funny. Yeah. I mean, it, it, we, we often scratch our heads and, and just ask as a puzzle whether there could ever be such a thing as an unconstitutional constitutional amendment. But, you know, it, it's, uh, I, it's, it's, I think, important to put the 19th Amendment in, in the, as I am about to teach some of the stuff in Con Law on Friday, constitutional law on Friday. Um, it comes in a burst of constitutional amendments that are taking place during this era that historians don't know how to label. Do we call it the Jim Crow era, the Progressive era, the Gilded Age? What the heck do we call it? But um, amending the Constitution as a way of making major changes, including changes that are aiming towards greater democratic legitimacy, is something that's happening in this period. So I think I, I think it's a good question to ask. You know whether whether thinking of affirmatively voting rights is something mm -hmm. that could even have happened. Um, but I think the message that we're getting is that we have a, a profoundly racial politics that would have stopped that from happening. Right? Mm -hmm. um, just, just sort of one last question before we move uh, in, into a very different direction. Um, I, you know, I, I was surprised in, in, in doing my own reading um, a while back that it's not like the 19th Amendment happens and then women start voting en masse. Um, no. So we've talked about some of the racial and disability related obstacles um, that would have stood in the way of women's voting, but I'd just be interested in whatever reflections you might have more comprehensively about mm -hmm. 
what it was um, that stood in the way, and this then ties back into the theme that, that's already been raised, of where women were doing their politics in the immediate aftermath of the 19th Amendment if it wasn't in the voting booth. Or we could not. Could well, win. no, 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 actually, <laughs> I would like I to just ask the question. answer that. Okay. Um, so the 19th Amendment is ratified in, in late August of 1920. The presidential election is only 10 weeks away. And so there's a huge push to register women in the states uh, for those who, who did not already have the vote. And there's only about 10 states that have the vote at that time. And so they are out there, I mean, really pushing to get women to register. And in a state like Georgia, they close down <clears throat> registration. They don't extend the deadline. The deadline was probably in March or something. And they close it down because they don't want black women to vote. So they're not going to allow any women to vote. So no women vote in, in Georgia in that first, first election, I do believe. Um, in other uh, uh, parts, women you know, do register or at least have the right to register. But only one in three eligible women approximately vote in that first presidential election, that first election where all women in, um, in uh, the US have the right to vote. Uh, black women do vote in, in quite a few states at that point. The mechanism of, of, of uh, stopping them has not been uh, assembled yet. And so in some states there are uh, significant uh, uh, organized uh, women voting. There's this beautiful story of um, Mary McLeod Bethune paying the poll taxes for the women in her uh, community in Florida and marching them, literally marching them to the polls. Um, but only one in three vote, about 10 million of the 27 million eligible women. And so the press comes to Carrie Chapman Catt and the, the president of the National Association and says, so what happened? You know, 72 years you're working on this and or longer, and, and why didn't every woman go out to vote? And she answers that voting is a learned um, habit, that you have, to, you have to practice voting, you have to learn to do it every year, you have to feel comfortable with it. And women have not done that yet, uh, not in, in, in great numbers. And she says, don't worry, they'll, they'll catch up. Now they don't catch up for a long time. Uh, it's not until 1960 where the um, percentage of women participating in voting uh, at the national level equals men. And it's not until 1980 when they surpass men, and we've been surpassing them ever since. But I've thought about this. Like, why would women not vote once they have the right? And what I've come up with, and this is not um, historical or scientific, is that, yeah, it was legal in, in some communities, where, but in some communities, it was still not socially acceptable. You have the right to vote, but it's a very public act to stand in the polling, polling place. And it could be that your pastor is still railing against it from the pulpit as a, you know, against the will of God. It could be that your, your club women were not too crazy about this idea. It could be your family and your, your husband and your, even your sisters were against this. And so there was a psychological hurdle to be um, uh, overcome besides the legal one. And I think that answers a little bit of why women who were allowed to vote, who were not prohibited, who were not being intimidated or, or um, having to pass literacy tests and poll tax, why they weren't voting in greater numbers. And of course, we could ask that today now. But. Um, that's, that's sort of, when I've thought about it, I think that there's also this social uh, and psychological barrier that had to be crossed. Okay. I'm also curious to, to, to ask, put you on the spot <clears throat> about the informational environment because when we talk about widening the aperture, thinking about that, I mean, as a journalist, I think about that in two ways. One, what was the aperture at the time that leads to our current interpretation of what was happening and how we need to reframe that? And then, of course, it carries into contemporary challenges that newsrooms face and very live debates about who gets um, access to what platforms and what voices are published. But in terms of, I mean, to your point about um, 
about voting being, being a learned habit, with, with the exception of maybe like pamphlets and niche publications that were geared toward women, what kind of access to good information were they getting to help push them in that direction? Well, um, uh, black, uh, I think Martha can talk about the amazing citizen education projects in, in uh, black, that black, black women um, uh, undertook. And also there was the League of Women Voters, which we are celebrating the 100th anniversary next week. And it actually starts the year before, but that was to educate um, new women voters on not only procedures, but the issues, the candidates give, give information. It was also not meant just for women. It was meant for all new voters, or even all voters, and they were also looking um, at immigrant men who had come, uh, might actually not be able to read and write yet, and, but could vote. And also uh, looking at educating citizenry. So we should look at that, that that was really part of the whole reason to, to establish League of Women Voters, was to, to give them that kind of access. For African American women, um, the YWCA, for example, is going to be very important, and um, and there are going to be the first sort of black agents, black women agents of the YWCA who are going to work in the South, throughout the South, with women and girls um, around um, civics education, but voter education. Um, so those kinds of networks are activated even before the amendment is ratified and really um, go to work. Um, I just wanted to add to, to Deborah's question um, one additional um, piece, which is that um, for African American women, um, the, uh, the changes wrought in terms of the administrative state by the New Deal are critical to um, their uh, assembling political power across a much wider terrain than simply the vote. So Mary B McLeod Bethune, thank you for that. Um, Bethune is, um, as some of you will um, remember, a, a member, um, some would say the leader of President Roosevelt's black cabinet. Um, she is um, the head of a federal agency. She is going to um, sort of use her networks that include historically black colleges, black women's clubs and churches, and more to bring African American American women to Washington to situate them in federal agencies um, where increasingly sort of the power of the state is being arbitrated, mobilized, and dispensed. Um, and so even as black women have a compromised place at the polls, um, they are building a new kind of political power um, in the, the new administrative state um, that we can recognize is still with us, I think, even today. Okay, I'm now going to shift this, thank you for all of this, to, to a different kind of question, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a little bit more of a grab bag, but, but um, uh, in our discussions uh, prior to this, um, many of you um, had really interesting things to say, um, excuse me, I'm trying to stop my stopwatch, here we are, there we go, um, uh, about um, the role that different players, different social movements, different kind of issue-related uh, groups, uh, played in the events leading up to the 19th Amendment. Um, and what some of the, in some cases, very intensely personal choices and strategic choices were that, that these uh, groups faced and some of the consequences of these choices. So I'm thinking, I'm just gonna sort of lay out some, some possible headers of things that you might wanna address and then in no particular order see what you wanna say about them. So you know, we have the, the, the suffrage-specific social movements. Um, we have anti-suffrage movements, um, which involve both men and women. Um, we have the press as a very important uh, uh, um, entity in, in shaping the debates. Um, we have lawyers, and something for the law students in the room that's always of, of interest, the relationship between the lawyers and the social movements uh, working in the area and who is driving what. Um, we've got huge questions, and we still have these questions in relation to voting rights, of how the suffrage movement related to broader movements for civil rights, um, for women, but also for other people in the, in the United States, and for that matter, abroad. Um, uh, um, and then, quite interestingly, there's the, the, the complex role that religion was playing on both sides of, 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 of these debates. So, um, you know, these are all things that one might want to touch upon. The floor is open. We, we won't have the time to cover all of them, but, but grab the one you want to talk about and go for it. I'm happy to talk about the press. <laughs> um, 
Well, I mean, so, and I would love to hear from my fellow panelists on this who have been really steeped in, in the archives as well. Um, I think it, it's interesting in some ways to me that uh, the informational environment was obviously very different than what we have today, but there are striking similarities. I mean, even just the images that you showed earlier were very sort of like meme-like, as we might think of, you know, you <laughs> might tweet an image that speaks to your political beliefs now. In those days, there would be a postcard with a very sort of um, easy to grasp cartoon in either direction uh, that you might display in your home. and so. I think the distribution of information and activism certainly was more physical because we had different technology then, um, but a lot of the mechanisms are the same, and to me it's just really interesting to see the sort of the mirror image of, of that uh, compared with today. Um, and then of course this like cropping up of niche publications is really interesting as well. I mean, I think looking at some of the, the Atlantic covered suffrage, I was just mentioning this beforehand, we had a, a case against suffrage that we published in um, 1903 uh, where suffragists were referred to as monstrosities of nature, which is not <laughs> ideal. Um, but, uh, but so I, I think you, I mean, I'd be curious to hear sort of what, from especially the niche publications, what you see cropping up whether pamphlets or, or smaller newspapers. Oh yeah, there's, there's lots of, uh, basically the suffragists learned in the third quarter of the 19th century that the, shall we call it, the mainstream press was not going to cover their, their movement. Um, usually, I mean right up to 1920, um, suffrage news is often on the women's page. It's right there with who's having tea with whom, and um, you know what what the the church league is doing and, and the sewing circles. It's women's news. It's not political news, and they were getting very frustrated uh, about this. And so uh, often they would there would be a woman in a in every town who would write a suffrage column for their newspaper and try to get it in, uh, saying what what. Uh, those women were doing and what the national movement was doing. And then they said, you know, we're just going to have our own publications. And um, so you have everything from, you know, the lily, um, talking about women's rights in the, in the mid-19th century, to the revolution, which was uh, Susan Anthony and, and Stanton's uh, very radical newspaper that only lives a few years. But again, um, the mainstream media, the, the, the standard press wasn't covering women's suffrage as a serious political issue, and so they had their own newspapers. Then it becomes uh, the Women's Journal, very influential, very important. Uh, Lucy Stone, it comes out of Boston. Um, uh, then it becomes the the um, the woman, uh, the woman, the woman citizen, I guess, um, as it evolves, and then you have. Um, uh, Alice Paul and her breakaway movement, the National Women's Party, has their own newspaper, uh, The Suffragist. Turn it around and the anti-suffragists also have their own publication. Uh, there's one that comes out of Boston called The Remonstrance, and then there's one that comes out of first New York and then Washington called The Woman Patriot. And uh, so you see that Basically, the women said, okay, the men editor, male editors are not going to take us seriously. We're going to have our own communication channel. They would have had their own podcasts. They would have had their own um, channel, but, but this is how they got it across. So yeah, it was really important because here in New York, the um, anti-suffrage newspaper was the New York Times. I just wanted to pick up on the meme-like aspect <laughs> of um, sort of the, the, the press. Um, as you said, postcards were something that was really important. You could disseminate them broadly and then touch people that aren't even necessarily part of a political campaign, but also that this is part of a visual taxonomy of difference and the use of spectacle and politics that was really potent during the turn of the century and then sort of going on. So we know that there is these displays of people um, at places like the World's Fair, there were freak shows, circuses, um, and these images were really supposed to capture sort of these 
differences between people that were supposed to be salient and had consequences to them. And it's striking that, um, say for instance, with disability, I mean with mental disability, this is supposed to be something in your mind, but we, were, we saw it apparently in people's faces or people's bodies, that you immediately know what you saw and this cultural common sense then had these legal consequences. So um, I do uh, want to talk a little bit about lawyers, if I could, sure. um, which is to say that um, I don't think we have to look far um, or any place remote to appreciate that um, the NAACP um, campaign, uh, mm -hmm. the road that we often ascribe to Brown and school desegregation, um, also includes voting rights all along the way. And so the mm -hmm. NAACP is going to be responsible um, for um, uh, seeing um, the end of grandfather clauses is going to um, be party to um, the um, prohibition against poll taxes. These are the kinds of concrete impediments that are being um, variously enacted in individual states um, that also lend themselves to federal legislation, lend themselves to constitutional scrutiny, um, even to a constitutional amendment. Um, and this is the place, of course, where um, luminaries like uh, Constance Baker Motley and uh, Polly Murray um, will um, variously um, cut their own teeth as, um, uh, as new lawyers um, in this roiling um, civil rights landscape that includes um, voting rights. Motley's early cases are going to be voting rights cases. Um, Murray is going to be um, Jim Crowed on a bus and um, transformed um, into a civil rights advocate, lawyer, and much more. Um, so this story of the struggle around voting rights um, helps us understand how it is that um, women lawyers alongside men lawyers um, find their way um, in an organization like the NAACP. Yeah. I think I, I, I do want to ask, just as a specific follow-up in this general category, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, given where we are right now, I think it's, it's important to acknowledge the role of conservative women in American politics. And yeah. so perhaps a word about the texture of women's anti-suffrage politics would, yeah, be, would be a um, good thing to add. I have a few visuals for this. Um, I think to understand the suffrage movement and even some of the retrograde aspects of the suffrage movement and have it, is to see it in some cases in reaction to anti-suffragism because it's not like the country agreed this was a good idea mm. at any point, even in 1920. <clears throat> and they had to really, really Fight. And let's see, are, are we queued up here? I'm um, not quite sure. Uh, there we go. Can we get... Uh, just get there we go. Go. Oh, good. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to look at a few, talk about memes, um, images that were used to by the anti-suffragists to depict suffragists and what they would, as this says, what I would do with the suffragists. And again, it's keeping women silent keeping them silent. Um, and so here's another one in the same vein. Pretty ugly. But this is, this is what they are facing. So this is the sort of social um, image of women are to be in their domestic sphere. They're not supposed to be out of it. They're not supposed to be in, the public, in public life. They're not to touch politics. Um, because it will, it will somehow um, uh, uh, change them. Women might change politics, but politics will change them. It will make them less pure, less spiritually elevated, all those arguments. Um, there, women who uh, advocate for suffrage are depicted as ugly, unsexed, freaks, um, why would an attractive woman who could marry uh, want the vote? Her husband should vote for her. So these are the kind of uh, depictions of suffragists that are in the media and in the public eye. Uh, again, down with men, 
uh, women who advocate for the vote hate men. I mean, we've heard this pretty recently. This is not a dead, dead argument. Um, guess which one is supposedly the suffragist? You know, um, it was, again, to, to belittle women, to make them less as women in the public eye, and to, to segregate the, the idea that uh, real women do not need or want the vote. So then you see something like this. Um, which do you prefer? It's a choice. You can either be a loving mother at home, or you could be a raving lunatic zealot on the street. Uh, advocating for, and this is directed um, to the referenda that, that took place in many, many states uh, where only men could vote on a, on a um, uh, it happened in, in New York, uh, there, were, there were several attempts in New York, finally successful in 1917. It also happens in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and uh, Massachusetts and it's voted down and they never try again. So um, many of these are unsuccessful, and this is a, a poster for the men who are voting and say, do you want your wife leaving the family? And that's a whole idea that women are going to abandon the family. So again, these are the social political arguments that are being used for decades against suffrage. Uh, again, it's bad for women. Um, it's a little hard to read, but it, it shows a woman ascending from you know, love and marriage to self-fulfillment and career as she goes up and becomes <laughs> lonelier and deadlier and she's leaving the children behind. Uh, this is what's going to happen uh, if women have the right to vote. It's going to disrupt the, the American family. Okay, so, it is so, going so, to destroy right. the family. So if we close this little segment with scratching our heads about work-life balance, maybe that would be a <laughs> right. bad thing. Um, I, it, this is the point at which, uh, I, at which I want to be opening the, the mm -hmm. floor to questions from our other roundtable participants, all of you. Um, and, and in doing that, I just, I just want to pose as a, a, a final thought that we get to decide what our aspirations are for this as a commemorative year. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna end by quoting Martha here. Uh, she asks in her scholarship, how do we avoid to giving into the tug of myth-making and sanitization that these sorts of rituals require while still commemorating uh, um, what uh, we've always more traditionally viewed as an important moment of social progress. So let me, let me open the, the, the floor up and uh, see if we have questions. What's our format for questions? Do we have a mic that's going to? Okay, so uh, uh, how are we doing this? Tell me, please. What? <laughs> I think you have a few more minutes. Yeah, we do have a few more questions. Uh, uh, but yeah. do you want people speaking? Do you want people speak? Oh, you ha we, we have a little bit more time for ourselves. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay, well, let's, let's see if questions come in and then we'll, we'll just thread those in. You'll, you'll put a sign up and tell me to stop when I have to. Can I just uh, mention, you talked yeah. about lawyers, uh -huh. and, um, and I think <laughs> lawyers oh, wait, really, time, really uh, deserve enormous credit as, uh, for, for uh, being on the suffrage um, cause, but I think we also have to remember that there were lawyers on the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, many, many lawyers, uh, most of them men, um, were very much against the idea of A, women's suffrage, B, changing laws to allow women to vote, and C, a federal amendment. So there was an organization of mostly corporate lawyers, because corporations were also uh, fighting suffrage for their own reasons. They thought it would be bad for their businesses, and I can explain that if you like. But uh, so there's something called the American Constitutional League. Think of it as the Federalist Society. Mm -hmm. And um, they are training lawyers and going um, out and uh, when a, a state did ratify, they jump in and challenge the ratification and um, use all kinds of legal me mechanisms, uh, injunctions, all sorts of things to um, to fight ratification, even once it passed Congress. Of course, they were deeply involved in trying to stymie it in Congress, which they did for 40 years. So there is this group of male lawyers uh, in the Constitution League who actually bring the idea that the 19th Amendment is unconstitutional to the Supreme Court, and it does not get uh, settled until 1922. So lawyers are on both sides. 
So, do we have do we have questions? Yes. Go ahead. We're going to try to get you a mic to make it easier for everyone. No, no, no. It's, it's, this room is vast. You take it. Take. I live here. Take it from me. You want a mic, right? aspect of the respectability of suffrage that involves some elite society ladies also. And I just wanted to mention here in New York, the first private women's club, the Colony Club, was founded in 1903, and some leading members of society, including women who were independent and had careers, um, would lead, um, they would go out of the club in a post carriage and parade around Manhattan. And this lent some kind of counter to this publicity. So I just wanted to mention that. They also led the marches coming up mm -hmm. from Washington Square Park, up Fifth Avenue and 47th, the right. women's cavalry, yes. and the yeah. marches in 1912. And so that helps. And those marches were very diverse. They reached out across class, and nobody's mentioned class today, but I just think that's an important Yeah, moment. they were. So, yeah, and that's how some of the women in the suffrage movement actually met working women right. outside of their domestic servants. And so this helps. I, I, I'm going to leave it to, to yeah. you to, yeah. <laughs> I don't have any particular reason to recognize it. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about strengthening civics education in schools today, mm -hmm. where um, kids are barely getting the bare bones of the conventional narrative, let alone the deeper, richer, truer narrative. So I'd love to hear you talk about how do we help kids um, know about this and then get excited about it energized and then apply it today? I, I, I mean, I think um, this is no way my unique teacher's trick, but I think it is a, a, a professor's trick and a teacher's trick more generally, um, which is to start in the present. Um, so when I talk to young people about the history of women's suffrage and voting rights, I start with a figure like Stacey Abrams, someone that they um, might recognize, um, who has a kind of presence and dynamism and relevance, in a relative sense at least, um, to their own lives. And then um, my question, uh, the question I pose is sort of how do we explain someone like Stacey Abrams? And you can't explain Stacey Abrams in a historical sense. Abrams herself has a narrative in which she will invoke figures going back to Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Phyllis Wheatley, and coming through you know, the long uh, pantheon of African-American women activists. So we can use Abrams' own words, um, but we can use Abrams to, I think, decenter um, a narrative. Susan Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton don't help us very much in, a, in explaining um, our own political landscape. So for me in teaching, um, there's always a moment in which we come to the present, and I think it's a question for all of us, right, which is why we convene, why commemorate. Um, I hope, I, I don't want to put words in the mouth of the organizers here at all, but I'll say for me, the reason to be here um, is because we want to use um, our best thinking um, sort of centered around the 19th Amendment to think about our own political moment. And, um, and I, for me, at least, young people are most responsive to that, um, not sort of responsive from let me take you back to the beginning and march you forward. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little yeah. bit about how, how journalists tell the more mm. complex story, formats <laughs> for doing so, opportunities for sure. doing so? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, to the point about civics education, I think there's also, it's key for us to help young people have the tools for disagreeing each other with each other, so both vociferously and civilly, and that's something that's not... Um, sort of all of the places, many of the key places where civics discourse is playing out are not engineered or designed for civil discourse. And so that's just like a technological and <laughs> social mm. problem we have to solve um, that in which journalists play a big part, I think, um, because they're not always good role models in that department. Um, I think <laughs> also just for the, the storytelling, the journalism itself, uh, I, and to the point, young people should be focused on this, everyone should be, just the limitations in how we're telling stories now, like it's still a very 
active problem in terms of how women in power or women sort of in politics are, are portrayed or even the questions they're asked. Um, a couple months ago, I was meeting with some members of Congress, some freshman women member of, members of Congress who are from more moderate swing districts. And it was at a moment when a lot of the coverage in political publications was around them, sort of the way it was cast was like they were having a feud with the squad and they're like, this just this very like high school language. And I asked these <laughs> members of Congress like, this, why does it feel like high school when your political debate is being reported on versus the way like men are disagreeing with each other? And even just like the terminology of the squad I think is infantilizing. Yeah. And they were really frustrated by it and said, you know, when men in politics fight with each other, it's treated seriously and it's just described as politics. When women disagree, it's treated as sort of high cat school, like a cat, cat fight. fight, exactly. Yeah. And you still see, you know, all the time women ask like, oh, you're a mom and you're a member of Congress. How do you do it? There are lots yeah. of dads who are members yeah. of Congress. They're very rarely asked. And when they are, it's sort of like, he changed a diaper. Like, he's, he's a, a hero. hero. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so I think it's really on journalists both to build the newsrooms <laughs> Uh, with people in them who know how to ask the right questions and how not to ask the wrong questions, um, and on journalists themselves to be thinking really, really critically about how they're shaping the way we understand the world. I think. Well, can I, I respond to that question about civics education? Sure. I'm right here. Oh, speaking. Yeah. Um, I'm from the League of Women Voters. Oh, I don't know uh, how many of you know um, that. The Department of Education has designated the first week of March as Civics Week. Mm -hmm. We're going to be going out into the schools and helping the students register to vote. In addition to that, educating them on why it's important. And um, also, we are sponsoring a um, youth civics fair up at Teachers College on April 4th. So if any of you have connections with high school students that might like to come, um, we'll be getting out uh, more information about that. And um, I, I actually had a question, too, that's not connected to this discussion about civics education, which I think is really important. Um, I'm <coughs> wondering why uh, or what, what the status the, constitutionally of women as citizens and personhood. What is our status as persons in the Constitution, as citizens? What was it? What is it now? Um, and I also would like to mention that people are all surprised to learn that when I first came to New York in 1960, I had to take a literacy test in order to register to vote. Huh. Okay. okay. So maybe there's a lot to talk about here. <laughs> Well, citizenship, Martha, is right up your alley. But I think just sort of one thing, going back to the civics education and sort of how we portray this, that um, growing up as a kid, my mother would always take us to um, the polling place with her. And I grew up thinking that voting was a miracle. I still think that. My students think this is really corny. But it sort of is a miracle that people go in and they trust that the state is going to take this vote. And then someone in power says, okay, and voluntarily gives it up to someone else, right? We hope. <laughs> <laughs> but, it was, but she also reminded me always of the blood that had been spilled in order for her to be able to do that. Um, and I think that that is something that journalists can always give us a sense of the struggle. But I think we can also talk about why is it so hard to be able to vote. So I applaud the League of Women Voters, at, but I guess to go back to the um, conversation we were having before in terms of even thinking about voting as this learned activity or all of the civic organizations and community members that had to do all of this stuff, why is the government not doing it? So why is it up to individual organizations even now to drive people to the polls, that you have to go into high schools to register people to vote. Um, so this goes back to this idea that, I mean, we could have two, there seems like there's two competing ideas of 
the right to vote, that it is so important that we want to let everyone into this political community and facilitate it because it's important. Um, it seems like there's another idea in which it is so important that we keep it from a whole bunch of people and that you make people jump through hoops and yeah. if you're not willing to jump through those hoops then you don't think that it's really important yourself. And unfortunately I think that the latter is often the one that mm -hmm. gives sway and journalists can question that often um, in terms of how they do their coverage of all of this effort that has to be done by the private sector and the civil sector that's not being done by our government. It's a good story idea. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hi, uh, I'm a voting rights activist here in New York City with Brooklyn Voters Alliance and Let New York Vote. Uh, I just want to say New York had uh, a literacy test, which is why we became under the VRA. Huh. Um, so uh, we have a terrible history here. And one of the things I was struck with is how little everything's changed. <laughs> yes. One of my issues I work on is ending felony disenfranchisement. Mm -hmm. And it is always set up by other people as if we give people the right to vote while they're incarcerated, it's a loss for someone else. And so could yeah. you talk a little bit more about what lessons can we learn to like flip this conversation around? Mm -hmm. Well, I think maybe one thing in terms of thinking about sort of the commemoration of this 19th Amendment as we talk about sort of these costs and benefits is that part of the struggle is just really like we're talking about a marker, a way station on the way to get to the beloved community in which everyone is a part of it. And we note the people that have been left behind by previous campaigns and then they need to be the priorities um, going forward. I think felon disenfranchisement and um, the push to enfranchise people who are incarcerated, millions of people, millions. two and a half million people are behind bars, six million people um, are affected by felon disenfranchisement. Goes back to these ideas of respectability, the purity of the ballot box, the voting as this meaning making thing. Um, and um, it's quite easy, I think, in a liberal society in which we have these rights, that they become port important because people are left out of them, but I think that we have to challenge that idea. I think as a um, historian of citizenship, I'm coming back to your question, um, but thinking about voting rights in particular, one of the lessons of history is that there's been no moment in our past when citizenship, who belongs and who doesn't belong, um, who possesses political power, can exercise political power, those have always been profoundly contested mm -hmm. questions. There's no golden age right, uh, of citizenship or voting rights. And I think that requires, you know, vigilance, right? I mean, uh, eternal um, vigilance around these questions. You know, I, I, the women I study, um, the women I write about, um, well, their citizenship has always been um, muddied, questioned, troubled um, from many sorts of directions. Um, and we live in a um, era of voter suppression where um, African American women are not um, uniquely targeted, but are disproportionately targeted by um, voter suppression um, schemes in, in our own moment. Um, but I do, again, in the spirit of kind of broadening our frame, I, I do want to say that I think we live in a moment when a notion like citizenship and in the invocation of citizenship as the ideal or the threshold status um, when it comes to political power um, in this country um, is one that we might want to call into question. Um, that there are too many individuals, um, too many Americans who are deemed non-citizens in this moment um, and are um, without the kind of power that the vote might otherwise permit them to exercise, um, and yet we are making decisions, our state is making decisions about their lives. Um, and so 
um, I think always being mindful that because the notion of who is a citizen and who belongs, who has political power and who um, can exercise it has changed um, dramatically, unevenly, and importantly over our history that we not discount or create um, approaches to the question in our own time that leave um, other Americans, our neighbors, our coworkers, our family members um, who are not citizens of the United States, who are disenfranchised in this country, not leave them out of this critical discussion when so many of their, um, their lives are on the front lines in this moment, so. Thanks. Yeah, I have a. One of the, I'm going to wait oh, for a cue okay. about when we have to stop, and in the meantime, no, we're fine. Okay, great. One of the the sobering things I've encountered um, in my travels around the country, talking about not only the suffrage history but voting rights today, is that in in many instances, both civic education um, and voting rights are being labeled as partisan issues which is very frightening to me. Um, and so, for instance, I was in Michigan a few months ago, and there was a woman there who was active um, in getting the state uh, school curriculum to include a, um, a segment on the history of the women's suffrage movement and voting rights. And it was being voted down as a partisan uh, interference into education that talking about women's suffrage and talking about civics was partisan. And she was just tearing her hair out. Um, and I think this is happening in lots of states when you're looking at curricula. Because of course, civics is not taught uh, for the most part anymore. Going, uh, bringing in the idea of, of voting rights, um, it's also true when I talk to, to women, women's uh, both legal women voters and voting rights activists um, advocating for expanded and enforced voting rights is also considered a partisan issue. Well, and, and it is in practice, right? I mean, if you look at how different states approach it, it's very, very, par it's like mm -hmm. leads to how gerrymandering is handled. Right, I mean, there, there seems to be one party that is trying to restrict voting rights and, and another. So it is partisan, but it should not be considered partisan. Well, but this, but this um, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, as, as, as we're doing this, I, I think we can be asking questions of each other as well as, as, as keeping things open. And, and this, this really, I, I think, helps to point towards the question of how, whether one thinks of it as the suffrage movement of the 19th and early 20th century or the voting rights movement of today, relates to other civil rights struggles, oh, right? Sure. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's if, if voting, if actual usable voting rights empower groups of people who have civil rights and other demands of their own, isn't it inevitable that the voting rights struggle is going to be understood as partisan? If, if we think that expand, the expa expanding or, 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 or positioning the actual franchise to where it should be is going to change results in the political process, how do we avoid a sense of partisanship in relation? You know, one thing that's sort of yeah. ironic is that when it comes to people with disabilities, the largest minority group in the United States, they actually don't fall as mm -hmm. strongly along partisan lines mm -hmm. as we think of, say, African Americans, or we mm -hmm. um, think about women. That, I think, has been to their detriment um, mm -hmm. because accommodations are costly and then no political party wants to necessarily sort of pick up that push because mm -hmm. they're, it's not going to reap the benefits for them. Mm -hmm. So, that, I mean, that's just sort of as like yeah. an asterisk mm -hmm. on sort of the partisanship story. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, one of the, I think, gentle myths that enshrouds the way we tell the story of women's suffrage is that it was nonpartisan, right? That it was a st struggle for women's suffrage. It wasn't a struggle around um, the strength of a Democratic Party or a Republican Party in the early 20th century. And um, part of what in our own time explodes that myth, though um, you mentioned Liette Gidlow at the opening in her work, on the early voting among American women is that, um, in fact, American women, some American women do vote as a block um, 
right out of the gate after 1920, and that is African American women. Um, and I think part of what has um, contributed to the contemporary take, which is that women's votes is a partisan issue, is the heightened visibility and our increased understanding of the force that African American women have and continue to exercise um, at the polls, and that is not a nonpartisan constituency. Um, so um, I think that as we've learned more, um, we've exposed some of the myths, which is the notion that American women vote like American men, and um, it's of no consequence when it comes to partisanship. It is of consequence, and I think black women have um, demonstrated that to us just in the last years in a way that means I certainly go to events. I won't say where or when, but I go to events where um, it is, um, we are discouraged from encouraging voter registration. Voter registration is a partisan question in 2020 or a partisan um, project in 2020. Of course, black women were voting Republican mm -hmm. then. Right. Because Republican meant something different. Mm -hmm. It did indeed. Thank you. Indeed. Um, I, I, we, we do have some questions to the floor, but I also want to, to prompt the panel a little. We'll, we'll, I, the, the people with the mics will come around, so keep your hands up. Um, could we talk a bit about religion in relation to all of this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, thinking, um, you know, Martha said that in order to really make this live, it can be helpful to start the discussion with the present. And so, I ask that question kind of in that light because I think it's playing a role now in our politics. Catholicism was something that was certainly, well, anti-Catholicism was something that was part of um, sort of this movement campaign, um, especially targeting the Irish, um, Irish Catholic immigrants. Um, this idea that they didn't know how to vote independently because they were used to following the Pope um, and they needed more sort of seasoning and acculturation in the United States before they could become sort of true uh, American citizens like the Protestants was. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, religion, of course, plays a role from the very beginning. Um, it, as you probably know, the suffrage movement emerges from the abolition movement. Uh, the leaders emerge from, the early leaders from the abolition movement. And um, the Quakers are very involved in both movements at the very beginning. Um, and again, that sense of a divine spark of all humans having uh, the right to uh, be, uh, be acknowledged and have, have equal rights. So, um, or at least have, have the right to, be, to freedom. So um, Quakerism is an early founding uh, part of this. And then what you see is in every denomination, there's a split. Absolutely every denomination. There'll be um, clerics who are uh, support suffrage and uh, clerics who do not. In the Catholic Church even, um, there's, there's that split. In New York, there's this uh, really fascinating uh, duel between two prominent rabbis um, and who, who just are from the pulpit uh, for years, uh, anti-suffrage rabbi and a, um, a suffrage rabbi. And so they're, they're, they're fighting it out. Um, and when it comes to the, the, the end game, um, the anti-suffragists use religion. Uh, again, this is against God's plan because she made uh, Adam to be dominant over Eve and to question that is, is really against biblical teaching. And they accuse the, the suffragists of being uh, you know, anti-Christian, anti-religion, godless women. So religion plays a really big part both in uh, f the foundational um, uh, principles of the suffragists, but also in the anti-suffrage movement. I think just one other thing to add in terms of this debate over whether or not biology matters. I mean, there is a religious debate about whether or not sort of God making two sexes mm -hmm. Are they sort of um, equal or are they hierarchical is something that's an issue. But then even when we get to sort of debates about Darwin and evolution doing the same sort of thing, um, there was still sort of this issue, I mean, as your images show of biology bodies 
mattering. Um, so just another thing to sort of put in the table in terms of things that we're thinking about or sort of reperiodizing. Remember, this is the age of eugenics at the end. Yes, yes, yes. Right? Um, in terms of who was in and who's out, depending on sort of what kind of bodies they have. Um, a last bit about religion, yes, if yes. I could. Um, because for African-American women, um, if we looked, for example, to um, Alabama's uh, special election and um, the victory of Doug Jones, we would recognize when we drill in that um, one of the critical spaces in which um, black women had organized um, around getting out the vote in that contest um, were in their churches, right? So that churches, black churches remain and, and have long been um, sites for political organizing, political mobilization, um, including around um, voting rights. But for me, um, I'll take us back to, just for a second, to 1848, because um, one of the long uh, factoids that historians have long fretted over is um, the absence of African American women at Seneca Falls. Um, and uh, part of what we might learn in this year is um, not to overread the absence of anything, but to ask where black women were. And it turned out in 1848 that African American women are in their church communities, in particular the black Methodist churches, um, insisting on what? Um, their rights. And it is in this context of struggles over uh, women's uh, preaching licenses, um, women's voting in church conferences, um, ordination to the ministry, in which African American women, by the time we get to 1920, have been voting for a very long time in institutions that were absolutely central to themselves and their communities, and that is in their churches. So I, I love Delane's sort of uh, leading me to think about why black women are so, many of them are so prepared to vote. Um, and it is in part because um, their political education has not happened in suffrage societies at all. Um, it has happened in black churches. Um, and that's not um, religion per se, but within those church communities as um, they debate whether or not women should vote or hold office, et cetera, um, they are using precisely the arguments and the language that we recognize as animating suffrage debates in the, um, in the civil um, society um, are also animating church debates. Absolutely fantastic. Let's go back to the floor for questions. So um, you've been you've been raising your hand for a long time. Can we get oh, you have a mic? Good. Okay. Yes, I'd like to start by complimenting the panel on an excellent discussion so far, and I'll probably bring it down an option. <laughs> uh, this is not really a question. It's more of a comment relating to the statements that were said earlier about how do you teach high school kids the civics and the issues about voting and so on and so forth. In 1952 and 1956, I was in elementary school, and my elementary school brought the voting booths into oh, yeah. the school yeah. and had every one of the students go into the booths and practice voting mm -hmm. and learn what it was all about. And that was for men or boys and girls. They didn't discriminate at all. And I don't know if they still do that, but if they do, that would be a good way for the education to continue. And, and, and I would just um, add that getting college age uh, young people to vote is a very big issue. Um, participation on college campuses, I don't know what NYU's rate is, but it's abysmal, abysmal. And, um, I'm, I'm working with some organizations that's trying to get uh, colleges, uh, both the administration and the student body, uh, to, to make this more of a, uh, an issue and more of a push and make it fun. Um, and they're having kind of rivalries. Well, you have a basketball rivalry with that college. Well, let's, let's have a voting um, rivalry. And, and I, you know, whatever works. Uh, but the idea that young people are not voting and whether that's civics education they have not received, whether it's uh, modeling at home, and I, I dedicate my book to my parents who took me into the voting booth. Um, and so that sense of a learned exercise, it's really important that you start at 18. And, and so I, I, I really think that um, 
and getting college uh, students uh, to understand the power of their vote and the responsibility of their vote is really important. Right, I think so that, I think just to disagree a little bit though, mm -hmm. is that it's not just about sort of apathy on the part of college students. I mean, this is going back to state and local power they that they are often discouraged yeah, right. from voting because they're mm -hmm. seen as this voting block that yeah. sort of causes issues. So for instance, in Michigan, where I went to grad school, the University of Michigan's campus is divided like a pizza pie, so, and the, um, but the campus and the center so that the students are not one voting block, right? So that they're separated out. Mm -hmm. Students have been just have been threatened that they're going to have their tuition changed if they get absentee ballots and they register sort of at colleges. Like there's mm -hmm. a lot of things yes. that are pushing yes. against college students um, being able to vote, which again sort of is one of those things. I think journalists really can sort of do a lot to, to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Melissa. This is a really terrific panel. Thank you so much for setting such a great tone for the rest of the day. Um, my question really goes to some of the points that Rabia made in her presentation. And I was really struck when you showed those slides um, about the comparison between women and the quote unquote mentally unfit and convicts and felons. Those are the same arguments that were made in favor of expanding the right to marry to same-sex couples mm -hmm. in the Obergefell litigation. And so again, not so much a question, but a comment, like everything old is new oh, again. Absolutely. And this rights language is incredibly manipulable and malleable. I think respectability is such a potent aspect of sort of rights expansion so that it's I mean, one thing that sort of, I guess that we didn't really talk about sort of the irony of doing some type of rights expansion, it's usually the people that have the right, have to, they have to be convinced to dilute their power sure. in order to, for that right to expand. And often that happens by the people on the outside trying to say, we are like you enough that this is not something that's threatening to you. So having it that say, we are Andrew Sullivan, or <laughs> like we, we are sort of conservatizing, so like um, to do something like marriage as opposed to we do kinky sex, we are polyamorous, sort of we are doing these things like that seem as sort of more from the outside. It's, we see that dynamic over and over again. And the suffragists certainly did that too, getting um, society women, mm -hmm. uh, and in every city, you know, in Nashville, they got the, this beautiful, uh, mother of uh, who is very socially prominent, very wealthy. She becomes a leader of the suffrage movement, and to counteract the kind of images that we saw of of, of women as as uh, you know unsexed and 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 not part of society, they distributed these photographs, soft focus photographs of uh, Ann Dallas Dudley and her children. She's reading to them in the nursery. And these were just, they were distributed all over Tennessee to prove that you could be a mother and a suffragist too. And so again, respectability, when New York society women and the Colony Club and the Cosmopolitan Club begin to, to join the movement, um, yeah, it kind of shifts the, the spotlight away from the women who really need it uh, but it's, again, to, to get acceptance. And so many of the, the strategies from state to state or federal um, uh, decision about same-sex marriage is, comes from the suffrage movement, that kind of uh, legal strategy. You know, I, and just to link it to the, the question that I posed, since all questions remain on the table, of, of what are some of the, at times, deeply personal and strategic choices um, that women uh, in the suffrage movement are faced with. I mean, as I've, I've been educated by these panelists, I've come to realize that there were leading uh, suffragist uh, uh, women who were in same-sex relationships and had to deal with the question of how that was going to be portrayed. Um, there were links between the suffrage movement and the pacifist movement yes. uh, in the World War I period that, that raised all kinds of risks for the, the perceived legitimacy of the movement as a whole. And how a movement deals with its own respectability politics vis-a-vis uh, -vis its own leadership uh, is something that, that you know, obviously um, carries into to the issues that Melissa's raising as well. Um, I, I think, 
I think we have time. Do we have time can, for one more? Can I jump in? Just oh, yes, please. Sorry. 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 Um, because let, let it, it says yeah. something um, new. Um, I, I think that uh, it, it's interesting, the associations that we're having with the postcards and the visual images. The first image that, uh, or counterpoint that came to my mind were the lynching postcards, which yes. were also I from this same um, yes. period. And I, I raised that um, to um, put on the table um, two things. One is that um, African-American women um, engage in something that we call the politics of respectability, which I do not think is the same as the sort of floating respectability that might be in the room, which is to say African-American women have learned over a century by the time we get to this moment um, that to, um, to show themselves too openly, to reveal their inner lives, um, to frankly um, is to uh, fuel, um, to offer up fodder to those who um, oppose them as citizens, right? That you can't win if you show yourself mm. to be a mother, if you show yourself to be a worker, if you show yourself to be an activist, if you show yourself to be a wife. All those things have been turned on African American women um, to delegitimize them as citizens and as potential um, voters. Um, but it is, the politics of respectability is a response not only to the lynching postcard, but to the fact of violence. Um, lynching violence, um, the violence on ladies' cars in which African-American women are um, brutalized by brakemen and conductors um, and more um, as white patrons, men and women, um, almost universally sit and observe and on occasions even applaud, um, that it would not be um, right for us to end, I think, this morning without appreciating um, that the backdrop for African-American women, the stakes for African-American women um, in the stories that we've told this morning are in um, life and death, um, are in a kind of everyday brutality, um, whether you're traveling across town on a streetcar or um, from state to state on a railroad. Um, and the most respectable black women we might chronicle in this period are those who have thrown down with conductors and brakemen and marshals and constables. Um, Mary Church Terrell, one of our best remembered of the black suffragists um, in the 19th Amendment period, um, tells a, an amazing story of being a girl um, on a railroad, separated from her father, briefly accosted by a conductor who attempts to put her out of the ladies' car and into the smoker. Um, and she pulls out her parasol and throttles him until it breaks. And it's a funny story on the one hand, um, but it is a story that reminds us that for women like Terrell, um, there is a life and death dimension to this, and um, respectability be damned. Um, woman after woman after woman who is accosted on rail cars, um, relegated to the smoker, will find herself um, in a brutal, brutal confrontation with men, um, witnessed by men and women, um, over the question of um, are they citizens? What sort of rights do they enjoy? And what might they do um, if they were also um, entitled to the vote? Yeah, I, I mean, one of the things I'd love to, we don't have time to go into is, um, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois, who's one of the great universal suffragists and really um, devotes a lot of time in, in his publication, The Crisis, to women's suffrage and urges uh, his male readers of NAACP to, to support uh, the, the referenda uh, when, when they can vote in the northern states um, and berates them for, in many instances, voting against women's suffrage referendums. Well, so I, it's, it's very complicated and it's very interesting. Well, I, I, think, I think we have to stop here a couple of minutes over time. I, I, I hope, I mean, I, I've certainly been, been educated deeply by this, by this wonderful group of panelists to understand what it really does mean to have a commemorative event for a social and political phenomenon this complex. And I look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you very, very much Thank for being you. with us. Thank you.